So, all right, cool. So welcome. Um, glad y'all could, could manage to make it over here from our power outage in the other side. I'm Dave McAllister. I'll be our moderator for today's panel, uh, which we're going to talk about sort of how to maintain a healthy balance of your work and your life. Um, this is pretty important as a topic set. Uh, and we actually can see quite often where things have happened. Likewise, our panelists have suffered through this themselves, but we want to find out ways that we can help you avoid this as well as teach ourselves a little bit about what's going on. This is designed to be an interactive session. Please feel free at any time to raise your hand, shout out a question, or anything like that. So with that, let's start off by um, kicking off our panelists, and I'm going to start here with Chris. Sure. So, hi everybody, my name is Chris, Chris L, just to make it uh, simple for everybody. First thing I'm going to do is throw my biggest fear right out there. So my biggest fear is that I'm going to choke up talking to you all today about something that's really personal. Um, but I feel as it needs to be shared because it's, it's important that I talk about this. Um, succinctly, just to sum it up, in my personal life, I'm a guy with a dog, a truck, and a motorcycle. Um, and that means it's essentially impossible for me to be unhappy. When I'm not at work, I sit on the board of directors for my local YMCA. And I also tutor refugee children. Hey everybody, my name is PJ. Um, I'm the founder of devrelate.io, and I'm also a board member at OSMI, which is Open Sourcing Mental Illness. How many of you are familiar with OSMI? They have some awesome handbooks on how to survive a conference. You should check that out at their booth over in the other building. Um, but uh, I've done a lot of things in my life, and a lot of them came with a lot of questions as to whether I was the person supposed to be doing that or if I was just kind of going through the motions because I thought that's what I should do. Um, so that, you know, finding that balance between, you know, being a dad, being a musician, being a developer, being a sysadmin, being a company founder, and dealing with all the things that go along with that, and having a family, and living a life, and having a personality outside of I do tech, um, was something that, you know, has, has severely impacted my life. So finding that balance was really important to me. Hello, everyone. I'm Amanda Brazel. Um, I am formerly from DigitalOcean. That's my connection to the tech community. Um, nowadays, I actually own my own business with my husband. It's called Brazzle Business, um, where we do some special events and then some media related to photography and videography. Um, but the, the entire basis of that entire direction is just meeting with people, connecting with community, um, and just gen generally advocating for you enjoying your life, because work is only a small portion of that. And um, I'm excited to be here today to help give you some maybe practical skills on how you can engage with a healthier lifestyle in general. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, I am Nancy Lancaster. I actually work for the Linux Foundation. My role is uh, with content specifically, working on with speakers, with the schedule, with the co-chairs, um, all of that fun stuff. Previously, I was at DigitalOcean, and I worked on events there as well. Um, I have experience with burnout, taking on too much, not knowing the word no, always saying yes to everything. Um, my family also has a lot of uh, a background in mental health. Um, my brother uh, has schizophrenia, and uh, my mom's very uh, passionate with the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And through that, we've, we've really kind of honed in on different skills and paying attention to mental health and trying to erase the stigma altogether. So it's something that's very passionate um, in my life, and um, I... Uh, have used those to make sure that I don't burn out again and with the work that I have at the Linux Foundation. Thank you. Um, so to, to kick off, we want to ask you all a couple of questions um, sort of as the first step here. So how many of you all are feeling a little overwhelmed by the, the pace of this conference? Yeah, I, I, I can, I'll raise my hand on that as well. Pretty good amount here. How many of you are feeling overwhelmed at work? I'd almost raise two hands, but I got to hold the mic on one of this. And then finally, how many of y'all visited Puppy Palooza today? 
Unfortunately, we didn't get to visit Public Palooza because we were off doing something else, but did it help? Yes, glad to see that. So that's really interesting. So to kind of kick it off here, um, let's start with a question. How did you recognize the problem? And uh, let's start with PJ on this. Sure. So for me, I, I kind of recognized the problem when uh, I, I had established myself in, in doing something for my career. And, and I, you know, I'd researched things, I'd learned things, I was building things, and they were great. And I had no respect for what I was doing myself. And it took someone else stepping in and saying, like, hey, listen, you, you beat yourself up every day. And you're, you know, you're on a fast track to burnout. And yet, at the same time, like, we all think you're doing great. And it took an outside perspective for me to actually internalize what was going on with myself. Like, I realized I was irritable. I wasn't sleeping. Um, I, you know, I have kids, and I wasn't, like, kind to my children. I wasn't horrible to my children, but I wasn't super kind to them either. Um, everything was secondary to me focusing on the fact that, you know, I was failing everything. Um, so it took, it took an outside perspective to be like, listen, you're doing great. Things are, you have a successful career, a great family. Why don't you take a step back and, and realize that's the case? And so it, it really took an, in, an external influence to, to look it back and say, yeah, you know what, I do. You know, things are pretty good. Yeah, sure, there's problems. But at the same time, like, if I just don't acknowledge that there's problems and I only focus on, on the fact that I'm never going to get them done, uh, fast track to, to end of life issues. Nancy? Uh, so when I recognized a problem was my boyfriend and I, we were trying to buy our plane tickets to have a quick trip to Miami, and I hadn't taken a vacation in two years, uh, no time off, nothing, and I was breaking down crying and, and screaming because buying plane tickets was overwhelming. Just that simple thing of another task added, even though it was supposed to be a trip to relieve stress, that little task was too overwhelming to me. And I, and I was like, that is not normal. And when I got to Miami, I was also a miserable mess and was trying to juggle tasks while on vacation and knowing I didn't have any backup and trying to figure out how do I make this work. And I couldn't unplug. Right. It's that idea that you, you can't have a vacation. Can't yeah. have a vacation. Yeah. How about Chris? Yeah, so this is interesting. Um, I didn't recognize that there was a problem um, until it was too late. Um, I would ignore everyone who would try to give me advice, and most, famous, most, most famously it was my own father. He would call me up and say, you know, hey, Chris, I think there's something wrong here. And just kept ignoring him, even though I couldn't sleep at night and all the signs. And eventually I got to a point where my victory for the day was going to be to get up and go to the kitchen to get myself some food and get out of bed. Um, so I didn't notice there was a problem. And that's why I like to talk a lot about how do we know what the signs are. Because sometimes we don't, um, whether we're not familiar with those signs, or in my case, honestly, I was, I was hopped up on my own arrogance. Um, I wouldn't listen to anybody. I thought I was doing great. You know, I'm getting great feedback at work, so I'm just going to keep on doing it, man. But I didn't notice there was a problem. Amanda? I think for me, I started experiencing anxiety for the first time. I had never really felt like emotionally in pain. Um, I would start to think about work while I was asleep. I wasn't enjoying like my personal um, endeavors so much anymore. And it was hard for me. I love that you guys said that like someone brought it to you. That wasn't so much the case for me. Like I, I was engulfed in that kind of pain, but I also recognized that team members were under the same amount of pressure and wasn't showing any really signs of weakness or struggle. So. I just felt as like part of my responsibility in that workload is to just show up and suck it up and it caused so much damage in my life. So I had to take a step back and be like, yeah, this isn't normal, even though it feels like everyone is dealing with this, right? And it's not something that I have to subscribe to. So yeah, I just felt so unhappy all of the time, waking up, going to bed, scared to check my phone. It was just very overwhelming. 
Uh, just as a reminder, feel free to ask questions of our panelists as well. And panelists, feel free to discuss among yourselves as well for this. Um, so let's kick it off a little bit. This, this gets into what can we do to help ourselves, really? And I'd like to, I think I'd like to start with Amanda on this one. Um, so I, once I realized that there was um, a problem and that I was really struggling, I, I made my commitment to myself first. I had simple, practical things that I knew could benefit me that I hadn't actually put any application to, right? So a lot of this we're going to share with you is not revolutionary information, but rather how much of it are you actually applying? Um, so for me, I started with my morning routine. I would wake up, I would check my phone, I would see my emails, and I'd be stressed from the moment that I woke up. So I committed to myself that I wouldn't do it, that work could wait the extra hour and a half. Um, so that was my first priority, and it was really, really challenging, right? Because I, I was in a, a people-facing role. People needed me. Um, I was kind of the face in the internal uh, HQ. So I knew that I, I, I was needed, but I, I needed myself to take care of myself first. So I changed my entire morning routine. I didn't, I didn't use any screen time before I got to work. Um, I began stretching in the morning, and that helped me feel a little bit more grounded and calm. I actually had like five-minute breathing exercises that I would do, um, and then tried to engage with um, some resources, media, uh, as far as, well, books and reading before I even got started with the day. And that helped alone, just grounding myself before I got involved. And then the, the greater portion was letting people know how I felt. So there was a bit of accountability to that, right? Like I was trying to be better for myself, but we're all going through this and sharing that experience, trying to get people on board with what the support that I needed also helped with uh, maybe a bit of self accountability for others, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, absolutely. Communication in general, letting people know that like I'm, I'm not available. And yes, there are situations where that's outside of, you know, what, what can be expected. But the communication in general was absolutely one of the main portions of it. And then just sticking to my guns, right? Like I'm not available. And I will not be responding during these like blocked off hours. And um, I do have hours on my Slack for a reason. That is because there's a lot of other life that I am attending to <laughs> that I cannot, I cannot split my attention to. So uh, the greatest thing I think was the communication and then just personal accountability to those rules because it was my health that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not a healthy me, my work is not healthy. So it, I, I think once I was able to communicate that and get respect around that, then it was just a consensus across the board. Granted, it's hard for people to get on board with that, right? <laughs> Especially if they're across the country and they needed me like yesterday. But work will always be there and we, we will problem solve when I'm online. And I think uh, to add to that, um, it can be, uh, there's some fear in communicating that when we have this always on culture. Absolutely. So when you say, I am not going to be always on and you need to follow up, like follow through with, with my boundaries because everybody else assumes that we always need to be on. We always need to have Slack on our phone. We always need to have our work email on our phone. And so, you know, there's that fear that you, that if you say that, it sounds like, oh, well, you're not committed you're not or, committed oh you have poor yeah. work ethic you're not a team player you're not right. a team yeah. player right. but you know once you actually c communicate with that that's how you start you know building this community of not always on right that we become every you know everybody kind of comes on board with that and together we can like take away that always on <laughs> culture that we need to have that work life balance right. well, i think and the, the key thing there too is like you talked about setting boundaries and then communicating those boundaries and you did it for your personal health but at the same time kind of setting up those boundaries a lot of times when yeah. you just say listen you know here's the deal i work from nine to four that's when you can communicate with me that's when i'll respond to email and even an hour in between there i'm going to be eating peanut butter and jelly and you can't talk to me uh, but you set those boundaries and like 
granted at first people are taken aback, but after that they're like, hey, you know what, this is actually a great idea. Um, and you see this actually in a lot, of, a lot of European cultures where they've actually made it, like in, in France, it's a law, you cannot email an employee after 5 p.m. Yeah. That is not allowed. Um, and people have, companies have been fined, fined for it. Um, and like, you know, as long as the is, everyone understands those boundaries are communicated properly, it generally becomes a positive thing. Um, at first, you know, people will be taken aback and say, why, why wouldn't you want to always be on? There's also kind of the realization that a lot of the things we do are not contingent. They're not life-threatening things. Like, if the server goes down and we can't sell three more pairs of shoes on our awesome e-commerce site, <laughs> no one gets hurt by that. Um, and I think this is, this is a, an overarching problem in tech, but people don't tend to understand that, you know, even if you have five nines availability, things will go down, people will live. 99% of right. us are not working at a place that is actually, yeah. like, yeah. taking care of people in, in terminal conditions. Uh, yep. Yes. Yes. Please. So what about someone who doesn't feel like they have a voice? As, 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 as I, I, okay. That's because you also, oh, you have a voice, but we can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what about someone who maybe is starting out in a new career or is yeah. in a really junior position in a company and doesn't feel like they can set boundaries? Um, what you know, or say their their boss is like, yeah, we no one's going to die, but we're going to lose a whole lot of money, and sure. somebody's going to be mad at me, and that's going to get me in trouble. So I don't want you to do those things. Like, what do you say to, to that well, person? Well, part of that is, in some ways, it's it's about voting with your feet. Um, even if you are junior, even if you are an, a member of an underrepresented group, or you're brand new to the team, sometimes that job search needs to be put out. Like, you know, you need to make these things clear in an interview. You say, hey, listen, you know, I'm not, you know, I will do my best for this team. I feel really good about the product. The culture here is a good fit. However, I work from nine to five. If that's not cool with you, I can't take this job. And that doesn't work for everybody. Um, I understand that's 100% a privileged position. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> and, 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 and that's, but, but it, it, it is also difficult. Sometimes you will have to suffer along in a place that doesn't let you communicate your boundaries until you can find the place that does. Um, that's, I mean, I didn't, I didn't make it that way, but I feel bad about it. Um, and I feel the more that you have people who are willing to support you, if you, especially if you are in the voiceless position, um, maybe it's better instead of going directly to the manager and saying, these are my boundaries, get some coworkers and say, hey, listen, I've been thinking about this. Like, yeah. you know, I've been reading a lot about burnout and depression and anxiety in the workplace. And I really think it'd be cool if we, as a team, started talking about, because when there's more than one person, that always makes it easier. Right. So... I want to talk about that a bit because I was in a situation, um, I got hired out of college um, and the company's policy was kind of like put a piece of paper in front of him, he has no choice but to sign it. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever the salary is, it doesn't matter because he's got no other options. Um, so I was in a situation where you really couldn't do anything. Um, my best piece of advice is to get someone externally who can coach you through it. Um, I was really lucky to meet a guy, I will not mention his name, a guy had been through the gamut in corporate America, eventually um, lost his wife due to his job getting out of control, moved down to Puerto Rico, or Puerto Rico, excuse me, Costa Rica with his dog. Um, so get someone like that and who is not afraid to tell you what he or she sees as the hard truth, will advocate on your behalf, knows enough people to potentially find you another gig, um, and like I said, is not afraid to tell you like it is. That's and honestly, advice. we don't have a perfect answer for you, no. right? Yeah, and right. that's part of the reason we're wanting to have this conversation. So us as a collective, right, can start to hold our, the companies that we're serving accountable and, sure. and making a space for that. And that's yeah. a collective voice. So I'm glad that you're all here, and I hope that you take that information because we're in this together, mm -hmm. and we 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 need to care about each other. And so I'm hoping that starting that conversation and being a collective will drive that kind of importance up, and there begin begins to be more of an accountability for that. And I think, like for you, you you had said, you know, you feel voiceless, right? And I think that already puts you as a at a disservice to yourself. And yeah, I think true. you need to. 
Oh, you can't say uh, okay, yeah. for, for okay, the general you, if someone were to say, oh, I, I feel like I don't have a voice, well, it doesn't hurt to just try. You know, like, go, go to your manager, voice your concerns, say, this is too much, you know, and, and if they come back and say, well, I'm sorry, you know, everybody's doing this, so you have to take it, then that should be a red flag, like, do whatever you can to get out of there. I mean, my, my sister, actually, she was laid off recently. She had two job offers um, at these companies, and she started the first week. She said, I need to work from home on Wednesday for my kids. They had an issue with that. She took off and went to this, the other company because it was all remote. I mean, she was able to, to do that because right out the gate, like, they weren't going to uh, accommodate her needs. And so I think just voicing your concerns, having those options out there, you know, there are options. You aren't stuck where you are. I had a comment, and a lot of it's been answered, but I would say having had a long career in tech and, and a lot of different um, positions in different companies, that um, two things, a young person that comes into a, a job, say their first job, they're not going to know that they need boundaries, right? right? Sure. I mean, that's Absolutely. not something they're ever yeah. taught. They're just so... Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that once you learn you need boundaries, it's a, it really is an expectation you start day one. If you if you let yourself be taken advantage of again and again, yeah. you will be it will be assumed that people can do that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know people who don't do that, and we all know people that do. Yeah. yeah. And so it's you know once you learn, because you're not going to know it day one. Yeah. That's right. So you know it, it it is I think on the management and the people around you to help you with that. If they don't, then once you learn it, you you have to do it because. You know, and, and people will be fine with it. It's just when you be, you know, people don't have issue one way or the other, I don't think. It's when you're sort of, you know, they can't figure you out. Right. But if they can figure you out, they say, fine, I know that person, five o'clock, they're gone, I'm not going to find them. Yeah. Right. And I, I, th I think you, one of the things that you said, too, that I think is really important is, like, you know, you, you've had a long career in tech. I've had a long career in tech. We've all had experience in tech. It's kind of our responsibility to spot those things. And when we yeah. see someone who's voiceless and coming through the door and, and clearly, you know, maybe they're just out of college and they don't know, yeah. don't wait for them to come ask you for help. Spot yeah. it and say, listen, yeah. you know, I see that, you know, I know it's your first week and I know you're trying to make an impression and you think that staying till eight o'clock at night is the right thing to do. But I mean, let's be yeah. honest, right. day one was paperwork and day two, you still don't know what you're doing yet. So what the hell are you doing here till eight o'clock? Like, I know you're trying to set a tone, but you're actually setting the wrong tone. Right. Um, especially mm -hmm. anyone who comes in, whether they're junior developer or they're, they're trying to come in and say they're the next 10x developer that you're pulling, pulling in, tell them to stop. It's not healthy because mm -hmm. if, in, in the same way that, you know, one bad person in an environment creates an entire toxic environment, management is not really willing to step in and stop it as long as production stays up. Right. So that actually is a great segue to the next question. So we've been talking about what we as individuals can do. What do we feel like can happen with work? Where are the work policies that can, can change? Where are the both, both things that can make life a little better for all of us? Um, let's start with Chris this time. You've been quiet. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, a more philosophical comment on the, the part of both the company and ourselves. Um, and I, I don't mean this in any type of offense. Um, we're, we're all very passionate, that's why we're here. But we have to understand that there is more to life than what is here. Um, for me, I have a dog, I love going hiking with them. Again, I tutor kids. One of my dreams one day is to move one of those kids into college. It's gonna be the best day of my life. Um, that's what matters. Um, you know, helping out in my community, spending, like I said, spending time with my dog and going hiking. That's what means something to me. Yeah, I'm passionate here, but there's more to life. And for both parties to understand that, both the employee and the company. Other comments? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd add to the, a little bit about that is, is go into each position with the understanding, first of all. So, Every company you work for will have some form of HR, formalized, not formalized. HR is not there for you. They're there to protect the company. Um, but they also have the information on how the company is protecting themselves. So when 
you're going through an interview process or you're going through a time of trouble. Find out like what is the company's policy on mental health? Do they do they help out? Do they give you time for that? Or do they cover psychological or or physiological, you know, not just physiological issues with the health insurance they're providing you? Do they provide health insurance? It's supposed to happen, but it doesn't always. Um, do, is anyone on staff trained in mental health first aid? I mean, it's it's a one-day program. It costs $150 anywhere in the United States. Every organization that has more than five or six people in it should have someone who's trained in mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. Find these things out. And there's great, like a lot of people put this into their policy. And you hear a lot, especially in the startup world, these people that say, we want to make our employees' lives better. Ask them how they're doing it. Just saying like, yeah, we gave them a MacBook and we've got a kegerator and a fucking ping pong table. Right. That's not making anyone's life better. We'll fix that in post. <laughs> Sorry. You were the uh, first one who broke the rule. You, you said you, we are passionate. We are passionate. We are passionate. Um, but yeah, I mean, like really, like when they say we're trying to make our developers' life better, or we're trying to make our employees' lives better, go straight to this, or either go to HR, or if you can, go to one of the founders and say, how? How are you helping me make my, how are you ensuring I don't have, suffer from burnout? How are you ensuring that it's not work before my, my regular life? And again, in the interview process, if you can, make things clear. You know, say things like, you know, hey, you know, I, I have an active lifestyle. I go hiking with my dog. You know, I have kids. I'm a hockey coach. Um, I'm also in a band. You should come see our show. They're never going to come see your show. Um, <laughs> but like just making those things clear that you have these things that you want to do. Um, Dave and I worked together for a while, and we actually helped to run a place called uh, mhprompt.org, which was like before OSMI. We helped people talk about mental health in tech specifically. And that was great because it was a policy of the company to support this, but also an opportunity to reach out to the community and do something good. So find out what kind of programs are available. Find out what the policies are. One sec. Yes, questions are useful. I'm still about 10,000 steps short, so you're in the back of the room. So I lead a site reliability engineering team, people in lots of different time zones. I agree that mental health is a priority, but, and I also agree, we're not uh, running heart monitors or, or things keeping people alive, but what about the people who, whose job descriptions do include being on call 24-7? What concrete steps can can companies, managers, leads make to make people's lives better? I mean, mm -hmm. just saying I only work nine to five doesn't work for us. Sure, sure. And and you've got a great point there. I mean, sometimes you you work in mission critical systems or you're an SRE and you have to have an on call. Having someone on call is important. Have an on call rotation. Um, yeah, but I mean, like, like finding, like, making sure that someone isn't saying, like, you know, they're not volunteering their time beyond what they're supposed to do. If, if you have the understanding, like, yes, you're going to be on call, you'll be on call for 24 hours. No one likes to be on, on pager duty. No one wants to be there. But it does happen. But making it comfortable so that, hey, they're trained if something does happen. Like, you're on call, that doesn't mean you're going to be called. If you are called, you're in a comfortable enough situation to make sure whatever shots need to be, whatever steps need to be taken can be taken. Um, that's really what it's all about. I mean, we know that there's parts of the job that are going to require outside of regular hours, but managing that as best as possible and making sure it doesn't rely on such a small group of people or a single person is what's key to making sure people are comfortable and can do it. So um, I would recommend as a, as a manager to do a gut check with your employees. Say like, hey, I know it's been really busy. You've been on call you know, X amount of hours. You've been doing this. How, what can I do to, to make sure you have a balance in life? And my manager happens to be in the back here, and she, <laughs> I'm doing a call out on her because she is phenomenal. I am very blessed with the manager that I have <laughs> um, because she's she's so good at that. She will say, "Hey, you've been working, you know, 45 hours, 50 hours this week. Take off Monday." She will make sure that I have that balance and I'm not going to burn out, and I'm I'm forever grateful. And that there, there are those structures, but then you also have things that you can personally control, right? Like, how deeply are you breathing? Are you filling your lungs? Have you eaten nutritious food? Or are we surviving on Red Bulls and chips? Like, <laughs> are we sitting in uh, positions that support that, right? Do you have enough support in your chair? Are you standing up? Are you getting some movement in your body? All of those are factors that contribute to your wellness and and your focus and your productivity. And 
yes, I'm saying those things, but really checking on ourselves and truly, are you drinking water? Like, are you hydrated? These are all factors that might feel so small, but significantly contribute to your mental wellness. So what advice do you give to people that are like a remote workforce? So I work from home. I find it really hard to step away. I, it's, not, it's not work pressuring me. I just enjoy what I do. But there, like when I used to work at a job, you know, I'd shut my laptop and drive home and that would be like the decompression time. Yeah. But now I, I don't feel like I have that anymore. Like it's so easy to go downstairs and just, yeah. you know. Get a dog. Get a, I, well, get a dog. honestly, it's a have timer. Children. It's seriously a timer. Yeah, I, I had a dog. Um, yeah, I, um, dog will start whining at me at like 4.30 and he just doesn't stop. And that's, he's an active dog. He needs exercise once a day. I have clear <laughs> yeah. um, start hours. So I work from home as well. And I, like, it, I have my own personal boundaries. So you have your boundaries that you might set with your coworkers. You have to have boundaries for yourself as well. Right. So say, I'm, I'm signing off at 6 p.m. Yeah. I'm as if I go into an office. You know, I, I go in 8, 9 in the morning but I sign off at six. And then I have you know, dinner with my boyfriend and I have my life. Um, in the morning, you know, I'll, I'll go exercise and everything and have my clear set working hours. I have lunch, I leave, I close my laptop and make sure I step away. Um, I also- <laughs> my, when my watch uh, goes off and says you, haven't, you, know, you need to stand up, I will stand up and I will walk around, I'll go outside, I'll make sure I have that. Um, and that's done wonders for me. Because otherwise, if, when you work from home, it's so easy just to like get up and go straight straight in and say, I have all these tasks I need to do today, and it's so convenient, I can just start right out the gate. Mm-hmm. Right? And then you just, you're just you there for eight hours straight, and you didn't get up once. I also, I, I've been working from home for eight years, and one of the biggest things I've done is I have a work computer, I have a personal computer. Right. When I'm done working, that computer okay. is done. It stays in my office. The personal computer is for you know, side projects, hacking on stuff, recording stuff, whatever. It's a separate entity altogether. So I have to stop working. Like my, my setup's completely different on, on the different machines. So even that little step makes a difference between work stuff and other stuff I do on computer outside of work time. And at DO, they provided training, right? When you start as a remote, like we give you all of, I say we, I was very invested with the remote. Um, <laughs> We would give them literally practical information about that, like treat it like you're going to work, get up, put your clothes on, and then and eat breakfast before you even start the day. Mm-hmm. You have to be intentional about that, otherwise your, your personal space bleeds right into it. So you have to have those mile markers. Even with your family members, it's mm-hmm. like, I'm done working, but I have this half okay. hour where I can't engage with you because this is my commute and decompress time. That is so important and make space for that. We are running very close to time here, oh. so um, final comments from my panelist here. Um, you haven't started yet, Nancy. Uh, so, like I said, for me, it's all about setting those boundaries, and one of the, the most important phrases that I have learned is, when do you need this by? So often, you're sent, like, hey, can you do this right now? Hey, what can you tack on this, can you do this? And you think it's ad hoc and you just have to do it right there, like, oh yes, I can do it. Ever since I switched to when do you need this by, it's normally like, oh, I just need it in like a week, Uh, you know, no rush. It's a game changer. And you just put that task up, have like a deadline set for yourself, and then there's your time management, right? So that's that's my like biggest piece of advice. When do you need this by? I think my final comments would be, you matter, and please take care of yourself. Oh my gosh, for the love of God, like just (laughs) take care of yourself. Work is only a small portion, and the better that you can take care of yourself, the better that you can contribute to the work and the communities that you're involved in. PJ. Yeah, my my final comment, I mean, it's it's kind of cliche, but you know, it's been said so many times. Nobody sits there on their deathbed saying, man, I really wish I got more work done. Take, take that in stride, like understand like, you know, work is work and it's great and it's important. We learn from it and we build our lives from it. But at the same time, it's, it's a means to an end. It's not everything. It's not all encompassing. Take time to be with people. Take time to focus on yourself. You know, if you get a therapist, have someone you can talk to that maybe is outside of work. It doesn't even understand all this Kubernetes stuff anyway. 
they don't, they don't care. They care about you. Yeah. And if you're not caring enough about you, you need to take steps in the right direction. So, A, start caring about you. Look at yourself. If, if you're not lucky like Chris and I to have someone externally and come and say something, analyze yourself. Say, you know what? The very least I could do if I'm not finding anything wrong is I can schedule one appointment and go see a therapist and just talk for an hour yep. and see how I feel afterwards. Okay. Take that step and see if that helps improve your life. I hey. So um, a couple of things. Under each of the names up here are our respective Twitter uh, handles. Uh, if you want to just reach out and talk to any of us one-on-one, -on -one, um, we'll be around after this panel. Feel free to grab us as well. But feel free to reach out. You know, just while we were putting this panel together, the insights and the, the compassion through this panel really came through. And so I really do invite you all to reach out, chat, chat with us, um, and help us get this larger message out. With that, thank you for attending today and enjoy the rest of the conference. And hopefully y'all petted all the puppies for me because I'm still missing them. <laughs> I hope they've so. We got time, we got time. We got time, we got time.